Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Beyond the Unknown. I'm your host, Jolie. And I'm Quinn. And today, we're delving into the mysterious history of Ouija boards. Join us as we explore their origins and share some chillingly inexplicable stories linked to these supernatural tools, where the line between the living and the unknown becomes blurred. If you didn't already know, a Ouija board is a flat wooden board on which each letter of the alphabet is aligned in two rows. Below this, there's single numbers 0 through 9, and then in each upper corner you'll find the words yes and no. And finally, goodbye is along the bottom. Along with the board comes a planchette, which is shaped like a teardrop with a window cut in the middle. The idea is that once all the involved are sitting around the board with their fingertips to the planchette, the window inside of it will move and reveal the letters, numbers, or words that are being communicated to the user. Now, where these boards come from and who is delivering these messages, that's the big question. The Ouija board is thought to have originated from the trend of spiritualism that dominated Europe in the 19th century. It later became popular in America in 1848 after two sisters, Kate and Margaret Fox, claimed they had contacted the spirit of a deceased peddler. The sisters became instant celebrities. At this time, there was no clash between Christianity and spiritualism, and spiritualism was widely accepted. At the time, society was dealing with immeasurable losses. The lifespan was less than 50 years old, so this board offered a sort of solace to those who were longing to connect to their lost husbands, fathers, and sons killed at war, the children who died of fevers, the wives and mothers who died during childbirth, and so on. There was just so much happening that was taking the lives of people who were just far too young to be dying. Spiritualist churches were popping up all over the place, and they very much praised those with the ability to communicate with the other side. This was thought to be where the idea of seances originated. I think we've all seen a seance or two in a movie when people sit around a table. It's usually just lit by candles. I want to go to a seance so bad. (laughs) I think we should have one. one? Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. I'm surprised (laughs) we haven't. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, you basically just sit there and try to communicate with spirits. I say we go for it. And Hollywood's depiction, and, and anytime you hear a personal story of someone telling about uh, their experience with the seance, usually involves some kind of like table shaking, some knocking noises or objects that are moving or levitating. So when seances originated, I read somewhere that all the tilts and the taps of the table actually initially represented words or letters basically being kind of brought out in a morse code style so like literally like yeah like a tip up in the right hand corner or like it was it was kind of crazy how they interpreted it basically the medium would then um later evolve this because i think this got complicated there's only so many tilt directions or things that can possibly be interpreted so (laughs) they want some people to have common ground they're like it's an a dumbass (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) so basically they eventually got a little bit better of a tool and i couldn't really find a picture of it but the description is almost like this basket that has a hanging pen from it and then the medium grabs the pen or writing tool they call it and then the spirit or whatever is communicating is taking the medium's hand to just literally just hand write with this person's (laughs) hand yes Seems a little skeptical or a little sketchy. I can't handle um, it. Just I know. Just just let me just write this message. I'm just gonna write it out now. I'm tired of moving the table around. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It probably takes a lot of spiritual energy. Um, but basically it's this like basket weird instrument that is thought to have later morphed into the planchette we now know today with the Ouija board. So when in 1890, these so-called talking boards became popularized in Ohio spiritualist camps, that's when a man named Charles Kennard, along with four other investors, decided to capitalize on it, and they marketed these boards. When the board was first formally marketed in 1891, newspapers called it the Wonderful Talking Board. The idea behind it was that you would use it to answer questions about the past, the present, and the future. It also claimed to serve as a link between the known and the unknown and the material and immaterial. Initially, it was also kind of advertised as like a date game because back then you weren't supposed to be alone in a room with like someone of the opposite sex or like touch each other at all. So because it's a game where you like sit around a table, you have to touch knees like that's in the rules and then all your fingertips have to touch on the planchette, they kind of market it to like people wanting to you know get closer to someone (laughs) and they could use it like a game (laughs) i know hey and like you're just like oh well we're not doing anything wrong like we're using a ouija board like this is legit 
Okay. So I know. And okay. I know how much you love a what like would this cost now game. That's all I want to play for the rest of my life. <laughs> We're going to do it every episode. Um, in 1891, when this board first came out, it was $1.49 US. What is that worth now? How much did these people drop? I feel like that's expensive then. Um, so I bought mine in like 2010 where my cousin bought it for like 18, 20 dollars back then. So I feel like it's more now, like 35, 50 dollars and 38 what? cents. So to me, like that's not a cheap board game. Like that's no. how they advertise it. This is a board game. So imagine going out and buying Monopoly and spending like over 50 dollars. Like that's a lot. Monopoly is expensive. That's true. That was a bad example. But like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. snakes and ladders. Life. I'm not yeah. paying $50 for you. Hey, I would pay 50 bucks for life. That <laughs> taught me so many lessons. <laughs> so apparently, in order for this game to receive its formal patent, because that was a thing back then, the patent officer insisted that the claims of the board had to be proven. So Helen Peters, a medium, and her brother, Elia Bond, he was one of the original investors. They were sent to the patent office by Kennard. The officer said that he would give them the patent if the board could spell his name, which was supposedly unknown to Peters and Bond. And it did. However, I'm a little skeptical of this one because Peters' brother, Elia Bond, was actually a local attorney, and it's thought maybe through his like social connections, he probably knew the guy's name. Mm, yeah. When it was first released, though, the board still didn't have the name Ouija board. And apparently this came from Helen Peters, who I mentioned earlier as a medium. Um, Kennard, that original investor, he asked the board what it wanted to be called. And the word Ouija came through. O-U-I-J-A. Well. Kennard said he saw the word written below the name of the woman worn. Uh, her photo was in a locket worn by Miss Peters. So when they asked what it meant, the board said, good luck. And apparently Ouija is a close approximation of an Egyptian word for good luck. Hmm. But I, I'm a little skeptical of it because the locket was actually a picture of a woman who is a famous women's right activist named Ouida, O-U-I-D-A. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I kind of think they misread it a little and were like kind of writing it out themselves a little bit. I don't know. That's just Too me. much of a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. So, so far, I feel like it's been a lot of weird coincidences, things that I'm a little bit skeptical about. And like, honestly, all the initial uses of it, the advertisements, it all sounded really harmless and playful and kind of almost comforting. So like, when the heck did it become associated with being like a portal to hell and demons? <laughs> One of the original developers, his name was William Fold. He started to suspect something was up with this game because on his deathbed, he made his family promise him they would never sell the Ouija board. Hmm. So apparently he was eventually running the company himself. And in 1927, there was a freak accident where he fell from the roof of one of the factories that was manufacturing the board. But the funny thing about this factory is that Fold claims that the Ouija board told him to build that factory. So he thought it was pretty sus when he falls off the roof of the factory told to be built like by the board. Yeah. He didn't die immediately. That's how he could kind of like come to these conclusions. He died later in hospital from all the injuries sustained because it was a very severe like traumatic injury. And so then on his deathbed, yeah, he was like, kids, like, please don't ever sell this board. But sorry, what the hell was he doing on the roof? Well, it was, apparently they were doing some kind of a repair, like there was something up on that fact. I don't know. But my thing too is like, it seems like falling off a roof, like that's a, like that can happen. That's a big, that's a thing that happens all the time, even today. Like when people jump OSHA up to like, thing. Yeah. <laughs> workplace <laughs> safety. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get off the roof. So I just thought like maybe he would have had some other negative experiences with the board to make him yeah. say something so drastic, like something that had brought him basically like his livelihood, his wealth. But I actually couldn't find anything else about him to say like, oh, he had this other negative experience with the board. But I guess that was enough to creep him out, just died from the thing that the game told him to make. Mm, fair. But it wasn't just Fold that had negative experiences related to the board. For literally centuries, there's tons of reports of the board leading to evil. But I actually found a ton of um, cool stories. We're going to share a couple of them today where the 
board could actually predict some things and actually was able to reasonably connect with people that have passed and share information that we wouldn't have otherwise known, in my opinion. So I have quite a few stories up my sleeve today, and it was super hard to narrow it down to just a few because since the board's creation, there has been so many people that have used the board to communicate with spirits, like even a ton of famous people from like Goldie Hawn. And even the first lady, Mary Todd Lincoln, like married to President Lincoln. Wow. She would conduct seances at the White House because their son died when he was only 11, uh, just a fever, whatever the heck that means. But um, I don't have any personal stories I can share with them about board because I actually think it's super scary and I won't buy one and I won't use one. I do. Okay. Share. <laughs> you have to share. I can't believe I actually don't know it already, but... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why I haven't like really talked about it much. So I, like you, was very terrified but interested in Ouija boards. We were young. We watched so many movies where it was the gate of hell and you don't dare touch one unless you, yeah. you know, want to die. I didn't, but... Um... <laughs> want to die. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I associate it with a straight up death wish, but yeah, okay. Well, you know, so many people are like, when will I die? And then you get some scary answer and oh, you don't want it to come true. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in ha- early high school, maybe my cousin Janessa and I, who were uh, like bonded at the hip, <laughs> we... I remember. <laughs> yeah, I spent all the time together. We ended up getting one and I think we played it with one other friend in the summer. Played it in the backyard at night in the dark. So it was super scary. Ooh. And we were asking it, you know, the basic questions. I think you have to like welcome it and and do some intro questions that the board recommends. And then we were asking it like things that we thought it wouldn't know or other people in the room like wouldn't know, like who's my best friend at school kind of shit like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And we didn't ask it like when we're going to die, but I did ask it one thing that came true. Oh. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) (laughs) I'm freaked out. Okay. Yeah, you're going to be freaked out and also laugh. So okay. So when we were playing it, we were like a couple days away from this event that my cousin and her friends were going to. And they invited me, but the tickets were sold out. That event was the Drake concert in St. John, New Brunswick. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> <laughs> the first time he like went on tour, I think. So, you know, before any of his actual popular songs came out, before YOLO and all that. a total dweeb. Yeah. 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 And I couldn't get tickets, but we asked it, like, will I be able to go to the Drake show? And it said, yes. (laughs) Of course you're gonna. (laughs) We're like, okay, this is bullshit because the tickets are sold out and I can't get them anywhere. But then the next day, one of my cousin's friends who wasn't playing the Ouija board with us got in trouble and her mom told her she could not go. And so she had tickets up for sale and I ended up buying them off of her and going to Drake. That's actually amazing. Yeah. And I feel like that is like one of the examples where the Ouija board doesn't do anything harmful unless, unless there was a demonic spirit that attacked that friend and made her do something so bad her mom wouldn't let her go see Drake. So maybe I mean, she's maybe. now possessed thanks to you. I'm going to tell you something <laughs> that we can cut out of this episode. That girl ended up, not because of this Ouija board incident, I will like to pretend but she ended up kind of being a bad apple um getting into drugs became a very famous porn star that's actually insane don't cut that yeah it's fascinating do you think that it's your fault that she became a porn star (laughs) i'd like to pretend like it wasn't the ouija board (laughs) let's say that it wasn't (laughs) <laughs> oh my god that's a creepy story though in all honesty yeah thanks for sharing you're welcome okay so your story was really positive you got to go to drake but the board is obviously associated as this like demonic portal to hell and satan and all things that are evil there's a lot of divided camps on how this is but there's one clear group who very much associates the board with um, an instrument of the devil like that's literally what they call it and that's the christian fundamentalists So have you ever heard of the book or the movie, The Exorcist? (laughs) Yeah, obviously. (laughs) Rhetorical question. (laughs) You know what, though? I've never actually watched it. I thought we've watched it together as kids. No. I've watched it as a kid. I've (laughs) 
<laughs> you're a nut. I have literally not because exorcisms in the Ouija board actually freak me out like that much. Like I don't want to own one. I don't really, I don't like watching movies about exorcisms. Like it, it's just too freaky. So I've not seen it, but the original story of the guy or the, I guess at the time, the little boy who was possessed, like that movie is based on a true story. Mm. How much that movie follows the actual real life events, I have no idea because I've not seen the movie. But I'll tell you the story of the little boy that it's based on and what actually happened, supposedly, according to what we know today. So his name, like sometimes he gets called Roland Doe and sometimes he gets called by his actual name, which is... You say Roland Doe? Yeah. Like Roland and Doe? Oh, Roland Doe. <laughs> Roland Doe. <laughs> <laughs> Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D-D-O-E. So his actual name is Ronald Edwin Hunker. And he was born June 1st, 1985 in Cottage City, Maryland. And his family was a like German Lutheran family. So they followed like religious beliefs. Sometime in the 1940s, when Roland would have been between the ages of five and 10, probably a little closer to 10, his haunt, aunt, his haunt, his, <laughs> his haunting aunt Harriet, who was a spiritualist, introduced Roland to the Ouija board. Supposedly he became like super fascinated by it, used the Ouija board, like loved spiritualism. But after her death, the family started to experience a series of strange occurrences which initially included just set, sort of like moving objects, levitating objects, or things kind of flying across the room. But when the boy was around, the family became quite freaked out by it. And being Lutheran, they enlisted the help of their local church. And a Lutheran pastor called Miles Scholes actually had the child stay in his home oh. to observe him. I know, kind of, I don't I thought that was kind of weird. Like, why couldn't you observe him in, with the family in their home? But anyways... I don't think anything bad happened there, but uh, he claims he also witnessed the objects moving, but there weren't any other witnesses besides Roland and this um, pastor. And he was so frightened by it and he believed that it was demonic possession that he said that the family needed to get the help of a Catholic priest because I guess Catholics are more, I don't know, well-versed in possessions and exorcisms and all those things. So Edward Hughes was the first priest to perform a series of exorcisms but this was halted because Roland actually injured the priest during the last exorcism he did. He was violently shaking and like making all these crazy noises and like ripped a bed spring right out Whoa. of the bed he was lying on and then like injured the priest with it. So they halted it and Hughes asked like for help from more Catholic priests and all these other people, not just a couple, like all, like multiple other priests all claim to have witnessed the same thing. The same moving objects, levitating things, things flying across That's the room. That's freaky. And obviously like what we know of picturing exorcism of the boy kind of like convulsing and doing all of those types of things as well. So they did another exorcism, but this time it was in a hospital and I assume that's just more for safety purposes. And then they brought in more priests and a few other officials to assist with this. But this exorcism was also super violent, and one of the priests got a broken nose. Yee. So, apparently, though, this exorcism worked, and he was cured, and he went on to live a super normal life. So, that's it. Like, that's the end of the story, basically. So, scientists today say, well, Roland probably suffered from mental illness, but the Catholic Church continues to use this as, like, a very clear case of demonic possession brought on by the Ouija board, and that was actually cured by the use of exorcism. So I can hear both sides. I can I can see it. But how do you explain that many people seeing objects float, levitate, and like fly across the room? I yeah. don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Like if you were to say, oh, this person just had convulsions and they were speaking all crazy, I might agree with the mental illness thing. But it's weird that it just disappeared. And I definitely yeah. can't explain like floating objects. Yeah, same. Because like when people tell you about like convulsing and roaring and making all these noises and their eyes rolling around, like anyone could theoretically do that. But the, the, the objects that people see, like how do you continuously fake that? Like even back then, like, I don't know. But on a less terrifying but still unsettling note, there have been tons of experiences of something called Ouija mania. And it's where those using the board ended up experiencing psychotic episodes. So still terrifying but just not as i guess dramatic in terms of the outcomes well in use or was it afterwards after using it oh 
like shortly after though like okay. not much of a time lapse and so there was a really interesting case in a place called and i'm probably butchering this name el cerrito california in 1920 and it actually led to this town permanently banning to this day possessing or selling ouija boards possessing well, yes wow like you can't have them at all and apparently the entire town of, I, I said at the time, it was like 1,200 people, went Ouija mad, as they're calling it, after only seven people used the board. And they were supposedly driven insane and it spread to the rest of the town. Hmm. And they had to bring in, and I quote, truckloads of mental health specialists to get the entire town back to like sanity. Like, what? apparently it was just, yeah, it was just cuckoo, like. People were running through the streets naked. Even like a police officer was like stripping off his clothes. Like everyone just went literally crazy. Wow. It's not the only instance of Ouija mania, if that's what you want to call it. Like there was a case I saw describe pretty much the exact same thing with some prison inmates that sort of just like made a makeshift Ouija board. And then there's one that's like pretty recent, but it's getting downplayed a lot. But it happened with 28 schoolgirls, I think in South America somewhere south of the uh, equator. Basically, like, officials are kind of like, whoa, 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 don't make this sound like more than it is, but that they used the Ouija board and then they all had to be admitted to for psychiatric care. So, whoa. Yeah. Hard to deny that when it's happened so many times to, like, large groups of people like that. Mm -hmm. Next, I want to tell you about a story that is mostly portrayed as an incident where the Ouija board was seen as making a mockery out of something but I have a slightly different perspective of the situation, and we can kind of talk about that once I tell you the story. But this is the case of the double murder of newlyweds Harry and Nicola Fuller, which occurred on February 10th, 1993. Harry was 45 at the time of his murder and worked as a car salesman, and Nicola was 27 and worked part-time at a local mall. On February 10th, there are witnesses saying they saw someone leave the couple's house in the morning, so this is the morning where they were supposedly killed. Around the time of the postman's route past their house, they also then saw two more men who went to the house by foot and stayed for an unknown period of time, but did leave. However, nothing had yet happened to the couple, and that's for sure because there's video footage of Harry at a store after that time at 8.30 a.m., and the witnesses report seeing these people that went to their house. That happened before that, for sure. Okay. So he then went back to his house within minutes, and I think they also saw this through, like, Cambridge footage. So then... A few hours later, around 10 a.m., Nicola's mom had been calling their house repeatedly, like trying to get a hold of her, because I guess they usually talked so many times a week, and when she hadn't heard from her, she was starting to panic, because it just really wasn't like her. But by that time, at like 10 a.m., so basically between 8.30 a.m. and 10 a.m., the couple were killed. Harry was found in the basement, covered in a white powder, later discovered to be powdered sugar, what? They thought, yeah, they thought maybe they were trying to make it look like it was cocaine and this was like a drug related oh. crime or something, but it was just sugar. So very staged. Yeah, super. Like, it's kind of weird. And then Nicola was found dead upstairs. But here's what's like really bothersome. She had actually managed to call 999. That's wherever they were. That was their version of 911. I think that's the UK. Oh, okay. There was a six minute recording that included screams, gunshots, etc., the call was handled as a hoax. <gasps> nothing was done. No emergency personnel, nothing. Wow. I bet you it's probably this case as to why. Do you remember we were kids and I like called 911 on you and then like hung up and then the police actually <laughs> came to the house? Like I bet you it's cases like this that make it that they will respond to everything. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I can't really find why that was like I have there's no more information about what happened there but yeah they just they ignored them and then another weird thing is that and again cannot find a cause for this but Harry had actually started recording all of his phone calls just before he was killed so I don't know if he was starting to suspect something was going to happen or what have you but there's phone call evidence of him planning to meet with a Steve in the early hours of February 10th they both identify this Steve as per their phone conversation and then there was also a recording of a man named Colin who was apparently pissed about something that Harry had done and wanted to meet with him. Hmm. But the police m repeatedly say, this is a red herring, it's not related, and you, we need to find Steve. But they don't, they don't really tell us why this Colin thing is like a red herring. So the Steve, his name I guess is Steve Young, this man called the police, told him he worked with Harry and sold him insurance, 
And the police were like, yeah, okay, cool, noted. Like, don't worry about it. Don't come down to the station. Like, we'll, we'll reach you if we need you for something. They never reach out to him. Oh, my God. So then the police, they then release the recording to the public looking for Steve, being like, help us find Steve. We don't know who Steve is. Like, what? So a bunch of people come through and they're like, yeah, like, this is Steve Young. And so before they even have to, like, track down Steve Young again, who already called them and tried to, like, give them information, Steve Young writes, like, a... I don't know what you want to call it, like a statement Mm -hmm. and physically drops it off to the police. And it says that he was the person on the recording. He did go to their house on the morning of the 10th. But when he knocked on the door, he says that no one answered and he left. Okay. So he was found to be a member of a local gun club and owned multiple guns and they were shot. He also deposited $6,000 into his bank account the following day, and they knew that $13,000 was missing from Harry's, like, possessions. Okay. Yeah, so apparently Stephen was in a little bit of trouble at work. He was stealing insurance premiums from his clients, and so he needed a bunch of cash to get out of trouble at work and pay his, like, own bills. And thing to, get, to make matters worse, when they searched Steve's home, they found a loaded gun hidden under a child's bed okay the reason he wanted to hide it is because it wasn't registered and he thought oh the kid won't look in their bed so it won't be of any harm to them so yikes naturally for that alone steven is arrested good i hope so i'm not you know a lawyer you got to handle everything with the the benefit of the doubt but like (laughs) jesus christ everything's pointing to steve (laughs) like steve come on steve i wasn't there um but i was there and i match everything (laughs) you need (laughs) right like he's just a little liar and a little bit sketchy so he's said to have shot nicola three times and shot harry once at close range the trial lasted five long weeks and ultimately steven was given a guilty verdict by the jury This was said to be monumental because all those involved, it was just, it was such a long five weeks. It was such a big tragedy. And I guess the jury were having a really tough time deliberating it because there was all those red herrings we talked about. But anyways, he got convicted, double murder, sentenced. Anyways, about a month later, there's news headlines in one of those fake, like weird newspapers saying jurors had used a Ouija board to make verdict. Get out. So when they initially looked at it, they're like, oh, it's just one of those like stupid fake news, like ignore it, whatever. Because it was such a big trial. Like, of course, of course, people are going to try to like capitalize and on British it. And British media still is like about so it. bad for that kind of stuff. Such garbage. Yeah. But I guess it was true. Apparently, not, I, uh, I did know this number. Four jurors in the hotel that they were staying at held a seance with a makeshift board and then they used a wine glass as a planchette. They asked the board who was with them, and the board replied, Harry Fuller. They then asked who killed him, and the board replied, Stephen Young done it. They asked (laughs) how, and the board spelled out S-H-O-T, so shot. Hmm. Finally, the jurors asked what they should do um, regarding the verdict, and it said, vote guilty tomorrow. So, obviously, a mistrial is granted because you can't use a Ouija board to make your decision. It's supposed to be made based on the facts presented to the jurors, and that is it. So, super unfortunate because in these cases, now you're dragging, you're dragging the family back through all of that trauma. Mm-hmm. And then potentially the person who is or isn't guilty back through the stress of having to find out if people have found them guilty or not guilty. But five weeks later, following another trial, just as long, just as arduous, different jury, obviously, he gets another guilty verdict for double murder. Well, I completely understand that the jurors probably shouldn't use Ouija boards. This was a tricky case because I didn't delve into it a lot because there was so much detail, but all those red herrings with the Colin guy and the two men that showed up to the house and then Steven's story that he knocked and then left and no one answered like it's all extremely plausible it's very plausible that it wasn't Colin because the, or it wasn't Steven because this Harry guy pissed off a lot of people yeah and I guess in his job as like a car salesman I don't know why everyone was so mad at him but he did so the money there's a few other things that make it a bit of a slam dunk but I don't know I feel like the Ouija board was right in the end yeah, that's freaky. I mean, they should just start using Ouija boards in court. Case closed. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like I'm making a bad argument for that particular case, but I thought it was interesting <laughs> that in the end, it was still the same. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, I could go on forever and ever with so many stories about this famous board, but to keep things in a reasonable amount of time, there you have the story of the Ouija board, the history through times, and a few cases that we found kind of interesting. Um, there's lots of theories about how the Ouija board works, suggesting that it's not based on spiritualism and uh, a connection beyond our reality. But I don't think these scientific explanations can fully explain some of the predictions and truths told by the board when the answers simply just wouldn't have otherwise been known to individuals. I myself don't have any personal accounts, but Joe was able to share one with us. I do believe that this is a possible portal to the other side that I don't necessarily want opened. What do you guys think? Do you have any Ouija stories you'd be willing to share? Please write to us. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Beyond the Unknown. If you have a story you'd like to share, please email us at moody.mediaprod at gmail.com. All of our sources for this episode can be found on our website, beyondtheunknownpod.com. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, listeners, stay curious and remember that the unknown is always just beyond the shadows. Bye! Bye!